<laughs> You're not allowed to have fun now. You have to report it. That's a good Come on, sit in front. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. I just don't want to be in the Oh, no. No one's going to be. It's, it's all good. And who do we have with you, Ann? This is Sierra. Sierra, nice to meet you. Professional helper. Oh, good. I love it. Oh, they're beautiful. <laughs> Go. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dave Tyler, um, and I'm uh, the Vice President of International Affairs for United Israel World Union. Um, I've been involved with the organization um, for a long time. Dr. Uh, James Tabor spoke uh, before me about the United Israel World Union, and there's a lot you can um, learn about us on the web and if you want to contact us directly. Next slide. So uh, I, I talk about wisdom. I love this Native American proverb. Wisdom comes only when you stop looking for it and start living the life the Creator intended for you. That could have been in the book of Ecclesiastes. Next slide. Another problem with a lot of these smart, um, you know, uh, people that are looking for the scroll uh, and, and all the intelligent um, Bible scholars, whether they're amateurs or professionals, they do not listen with the intent to understand. They're listening with the intent to reply. I'm only going to ask the people here, and especially those people that watch this online, please hear what I have to say before you start getting all upset about it. If we can have a dialogue later and you disagree, I will respect that disagreement. Uh, but don't try to tell me what I'm going to say before I say it and say why it's wrong. I disagree. Next. <laughs> all right, next slide. All right, so I'm going to give you the, you know, uh, um, uh, the, you know, the three T's approach. Uh, apparently, uh, Timothy Thompson and his family have a lot of T's, but the three T's in the military. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you what I told you. And that's why you get to a, 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 a private first class. Then, uh, so we're going to do a little introduction about the background. Why would I consider even looking for the scroll, the issues of providence, um, the source, the hunt, and some conclusions. Okay, so as we go into the introduction... Um, why do I care about these issues? Well, we're born ignorant in the world. I mean, we know how to breathe. We know how to sleep. We have to be taught how to eat. About creation and why we're here, there's no, we have no idea. So we're brought up in a culture that tells us what those things are. And that cultures have changed. If you want to look at the last years of, of millennia of human existence, there was pre-modern, there's modern, there was postmodern. And that's what we live in today, a postmodern world, which is really difficult for some of us to live in. Where do we come from? How long have we been in existence? Why do we exist? What's the purpose of life? So that, that's what I'm saying. So I always look for the ultimate truth of scriptures. Um, and, and as I started peeling that onion, like many of you here have, uh, it starts getting to be lesser and lesser and lesser. And the religiosity and uh, the, um, um, the man-made um, oral traditions seem to mean less. Um, also, uh, this, this book is a provocative writing that fits in the unredacted biblical narrative. I'm not going to get into that, but Jono and Ross will, and they're going to have talks that are related to mine. The other thing about this scroll is it was discovered before there was a significant level of any kind of analytical to, uh, uh, capability to, to look at carbon dating or to look at the analysis of inks and, and all those kinds of things. Um, so we want to find it to get it into a laboratory. And um, it just might give us uh, insight to Moses in his relationship to the Creator. My point is, I said might. That's it. Next slide. So. There's also been some great people that have gone before me. If you look at these, I'm not going to read through all of them, but there's been a lot of people who have studied these scrolls, and many more than this. These scrolls uh, have been looked by some really great people, and those are some of my favorites. Uh, Ross Nichols and the Moses Scroll, of course, we kind of looked at that. Um, Idan Dershowitz, I mean, what he published was just amazing. Um, and and uh, the movie uh, Shapiro and I by Yoram Sabo, that's available free of charge on, online. 
Uh, and of course, we have this secret weapon named Matthew Hamilton in Australia. This, this guy is a savant. He has filed a, a, a room of files on Shapira. And when we have a question, in fact, he'll be watching this today because I mentioned Shapira, and he'll correct what I said wrong here. And, <laughs> and I welcome that correction. It's all about getting to the end, all right? So uh, a lot of people give this, this, this hoity-toity word provenance um, a really big deal. And, and they try to just slice it and say, this doesn't have it, we're going to throw it out. Um, imagine, because this really came from art before it was ever in, in archaeology or, or manuscripts. And imagine if you found a, a da Vinci and it didn't have the right provenance and it was really a da Vinci. Mm -hmm. Well, it's still a da Vinci whether some expert says it is or it isn't. That's the first thing I'm going to say. So this a priori thing. What about the Dead Sea Scrolls? What was their provenance before... We found them before some Bedouins found them. Where were they for the last 2,000 years? How do you, so, you, so it's a matter of when you want to start talking about it. So also uh, another problem is a lot of subject matter experts, and I include academics and civilian people that are, that are not paid to, to study, they have such a point of view that they already have preconceived, so they're going to make the data fit their solution. We had this in our company. Man had this solution using neural nets. And every problem in the world was solvable. He had a solution, neural nets. He, he needed to find the problems. And it's not that way. It's the, you understand what the problem is, then you find a solution. And they're all, they go all over from maximalists, minimalists, minimalists uh, you know, atheists, and so on. Um, the other part, and I'm, I'm sure that Jono is, and Ross are going to knock this one out of the park, is that many of these subject matter experts don't know the underlying message of the Hebrew Bible. Does this thing even make sense? That, to me, is much bigger than the other epigraphy and things that they talk about. Does it make sense? Did, d does it fit in the narrative to compare Scripture with Scripture? So that's a big deal. Next slide. So uh, what is providence? It's the place or origin uh, of, of something, uh, the beginning of something's existence, something's origin. A record of ownership is also another thing. So really, the works of art were the ones this came from. And you know how that's all being ruined today, don't you? They trade big amounts of art for billions of dollars, and they're worthless, but they're just laundering money. So mm -hmm. there you go with Providence. I'm just telling you, be careful. So some of the initial concerns for the Shapira scroll were, how could this script last in thousands of years in a desert? It couldn't be. Well, that was 70 years before we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And guess what? They can live that long in the desert. Um, why would the scroll be packed the way it was? Well, we found in the Dead Sea Scrolls they were packed that way. Uh, and um, how could this be anything from the Bible? Like, it's preposterous that you say you found something. Those are not good reasons. I use facts, and I'll explain why. And, you know, is someone trying to make a huge profit? And that's, you know, that's something that you could legitimately say he wanted a million pounds in 1883, which would be over um, $100 million today. You know, so I, I understand that, that that would get my cockles up. I'd say, wait a minute, what's this all about? Next slide. So um, there's a, the preconceived notion that I've talked about. Um, but wait a minute. The original scholars, no one talks about this. The original scholars who reviewed and analyzed it, what did they say? What was their personal thoughts? And, of course, uh, there's a big uh, uh, criticisms with epigraphal analysis, handwriting. Well, I'm not going to show you because it could be copied, but I looked at my handwriting from um, the fourth grade till now, and it's unrecognizable. So don't go talking about which way a, a vav is slanted. Sorry, that, that doesn't work for me. Um, people get way over. And so next slide. It also, um, there's also other um, pride issues. Some scholars won't even look into it because they believe gives the scrolls you know, um, some credibility. I'm not even going to look at that. That's how bad that is. Um, so what I'm saying, when you go looking for something, you consider all the evidence, and most people don't. They look at this stovepipe that's really deep. Um, and so we use something like the theory of constraints. And I'll, I'm going to give you a slide that shows you what those are, and some of these issues will be addressed in this talk. And certainly Jono and Ross are going to uh, elaborate on these issues. So if we look at it from a forensics point of view, if I was an attorney for William Shapira, uh, I, would, I would start looking at other areas. 
And this is what people don't do when they look at these things. And so when you look at it, you have to look at all the issues uh, on um, guilt or not, uh, not guilt. Next slide. So we're going to go to the source. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar with where the Dead Sea is, um, but it's, um, this is Jordan and this is Israel. And, of course, the Mediterranean's over there. And there's Qumran. And down here is where you can see these strips were found by the Bedouins of the area in um, 1865. Um, just a little sales point here. Uh, Jono and Ross are going on a Jordanian trip and they will be going to these places. And we suggest if you're interested in this topic to go there as well as many other great places. Next slide. So enter Moses Shapira. Um, he was born in 1830 to Polish Jewish um, parents, which is in now Ukraine, uh, was Poland then. Um, his father immigrated to the Ottoman Palestine uh, without Moses, and later Moses joined him in the Holy Land. He was an expert at ancient scripts, and he was an antiquities dealer in Jerusalem. Um, it's another thing, if you go with uh, Ross Hill and, and Jono, they'll always take you to the places where we actually go to his shop. His shop, and so it's, it's stuff you can touch. Also, the um, Christ Church church where he was married, and you could actually see his marriage, um, you know, de de description and all that kind of thing. Next slide. So um, <clears throat> he hears of them in 1878. So you see that distance that we we just traveled. I mean, there's there's already years that are going by, and he's really interested. This man came through and said, "I have these scripts." these uh, uh, strips of leather, and, and we think there's something. And so there was this kind of clandestine thing. Now, I left all this. I'm not going to read it. I left it so that if you want to get my presentation, you can read through all this. A really much easier way is just to get the, um, the Moses uh, scroll book, and Ross does it in much more detail. But this kind of clandestine meeting, and he kept buying them, and here's where there's one of the clues. There's 16 leather strips and that was the end of August of 1878. So Shapira is really excited. Now, he really helped with asylum um, inscription analysis, so he knew Pele Hebrew and Phoenician and other ancient languages. Next slide. So um, he really became convinced, this, this looks like the book of Deuteronomy. Um, so he sent them uh, to a German scholar, Schlottmann, and I love to say it because he's, he's not a nice guy. Schlottmann had him. Okay, Schlottmann, and uh, Schlottmann says this is fake, and so um, Shapira put the fragments in the bank for five years, just said. Now, you can imagine your life, you know, like you, five years ago you did that. Like, I don't know, I don't want to go back into that subject. Next slide. So then enter Schroeder. He's a nice guy. Uh, so Shapira uh, said that in around Easter of 1883, he he thought, I can't just leave these there. And so um, he sent them to Schroeder, and Schroeder said, these are genuine. Now, can you imagine the feeling at that moment of Shapira, like being a Jew? And this is the book that says, not Moses did that and this. It said, I talked to the Almighty. I did. First person. There's a big difference. Ross is going to talk about that in his talk, um, but he kind of made a hint about this three years ago before we ever had the Shapira scroll. Uh, so in uh, May of 83, um, Shapira wrote a letter. Um, and uh, th again, this is a typical uh, Professor Strack said, it's a forgery sight unseen. Well, if you didn't see it, how could you say it's a... There was no uh, facsimiles or photographs that were sent back and forth. Then... Um, he goes to Berlin to see Strack, but Strack claims to have problems with his eyes, and he doesn't even examine them. So how can you say they're forgeries, right? Schroeder is a good guy. So the next slide. Um, so Shapira goes to Leipzig to visit Hermann Guth. Of course, this is where they work together on the Siloam inscription, and Guth gets another scholar, Edward Mayer, and the Guth and Mayer, Guth and Mayer are there, and they start their analysis of the scrolls, in July of 1883. Next slide. Uh, so then they also bring in Erdman, or er Erman. They believe the fragments were authentic and uh, ancient. Now, this is in their personal communications, which I'll explain. <laughs> they brought in uh, Adolf and Erman, and he, he believed they're authentic. He even said if they're not genuine, he would eat them. So these are the original people, the scholars. They're all young scholars. I know they look old because people back then, when they were 20, they looked old. Um, 
and, and, and they, they thought, well, we got this covered. Next slide. So they went and worked on a, for a week, uh, and, and they went to try to convince the older scholars, hey, look, these are real scrolls. Uh, the Germans never made a suitable um, offer, and so Shapiro decided to go to London. Um, the, later, the, the, the older German scholars would claim they examined the script for 90 minutes. That's a lie. They, they, they had these young guys looking at it for a week. So why are you saying you only looked at it for 90 minutes? Well, that was the final meeting, but they didn't even look at the scrolls at that meeting. They just said they're not authentic. Uh, so uh, Gute and Meyer, uh, in a 94-page academic assessment, um, they uh, said that, um, th they, that the scrolls weren't genuine. However, we know from the dialogue between the scholars, the new scholars, they were looking for a career in, in biblical scholarship and you know, ancient manuscripts. The old scholars came in and said, you know, gee, Sarah, if, if you want to have a career here, I think you're going to find out that those scrolls are not original. They're, they're fakes. They're forgeries. And if you tell a young scholar that, you're going to bias them. It's kind of like today when we see a drug company hire a bunch of uh, chemists to look at their drugs and, and give them a million dollars to do so. Are, are you going to say their drugs are no good? You, you kind of have the idea that, hey, if you want some more millions, uh, you know, you're going to come out with a, a, a preconceived answer, which is what I started talking about. Next slide. So what does Ross start doing? He finds these this book, he starts translating it in Google, Ross. You know, he's like, it's having trouble. Well, it has old German in it. And uh, we happen to own a company that we do um, translations and cultural analysis. And we have, um, you know, about 13 or 1400, um, you know, experts, which are not part of our company. They're just consultants. And we found a young man who was an expert at this. And we hired him to translate this book into English. Um, this book opens the door to a lot. Ross, when are we going to get that book out? Like in a week or two? It'll be out in a week or two. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So you. Wait, just quickly. Yeah. That, that photo there, you're yeah. seeing the cover that we just had designed. Yeah. That's not the original. That's what we're going to republish with. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's something that Daniel Wright did. He's really good at that. So uh, we published it. So wait a minute. You're condemning this scroll and this is the guy that saw it and you're not even asking, you're not even consenting to what he said unless you could read German and old German. Um, and so this is really gets into the details. Um, but the, this also starts to uh, lead us to individual letters that went back and forth. Again, when I talked about forensics, it's the whole case. So the theory of constraints helps us set boundaries, but we're not cutting out the fact that, well, what did you think? You know, a good detective goes back in a cold case and says, Mrs. Robinson, what really happened? Well, you know, Ralphie, he always got a little crazy sometimes, and he was drinking that night. Oh, that's not down here. You know, these types of things. All right, next slide. So this is what Guta put down. We wouldn't know the order and the content of the strips today. No one else wrote it down. We know what the Moses scroll says. The Shapiro scroll, we know what it says. Well, there's parts of it that we can't read and he couldn't read, which is why we'd like to find it. But the fact is, this was the guy in his team. They were the ones that read this. Ross is going to get into this very much more, but even Ross started picking up that there were differences in how many scrolls people thought. And he, he'll explain that in, in more detail. Next slide. So the 90-minute meeting, you know, well, it was a lie. There was a 90-minute ending meeting, and it, um, they decided against its authenticity, but it didn't, Shapiro didn't know this. He was headed to London. Next slide. So <clears throat> I wanted to go <clears throat> to uh, look at these uh, documents, these supporting documents, and um, uh, Idan, Dr. Dershowitz, who, who wrote that, the great um, treaty on the scroll uh, from a very, very technical point of view, um, he helped us get connected with Petra. And Petra is an amazing um, a librarian. Um, he has a graduate degree in library sciences, and she focuses on um, Hebraic and Jewish 
documents. So I went there to, um, to London or to uh, Berlin, and she helped me pull out of these knock losses. Is that what they're called, Ross? The knock losses, which are so when a scholar dies, they put all their um, information in a knock loss. And so uh, it's kind of like a little uh, mausoleum for their work, especially when there wasn't digital and all this other stuff, you know. So, next slide. I went there and I got to hold. Shapiro's and, and Myers, I, I got to hold their writing in my hand. It, it was unbelievable. I was in Berlin, and no one was hardly there because of uh, COVID, and I got to look at their writings. And they were experts on things like hieroglyphs. I mean, these were brilliant people. They weren't just some people trying to scrounge around. Next slide. This is, look, at Edward Meyer. That's his writing. I mean, really? I got to touch that. Oh, it gets better. Okay, next slide. So we then realized we had to go to London. Um, a, a, a lot of letters have been digitized. And we've helped pay for some of the digitization, and, and, and those are available now to download. So you can start seeing the, the correspondence. And what the correspondence tells you is amazing. They believed this scroll was real. And they were told, it ain't real. I use ain't because, you know, it's not good English. <laughs> so we, we then went to the, uh, he, well, Shapira went to the Palestine Exploration Fund, or the PEF, and he, he met with the secretary, and um, that's a British society based in London, founded in 1865, and they did all these great surveys in um, Israel and in the, in the Levant, if you will. The interesting thing, uh, if you're ever on your way down to Tamar, and you're on, the, on 90 going south by the Dead Sea on the left. On the right, you'll see a, a high water mark from the a survey that they did, and it says the PEF. You got to catch that. I almost go into the, uh, the Dead Sea crashing because I'm looking for it like, oh, yeah, yeah, but, but. Okay, so uh, then Claude Condor was there, and there was a meeting set, and they, they then handed the football off to Christian David Ginsburg. Here's something I just look at as a investigator. You know, Moses Shapira Jew, Moses Wilhelm Shapira Christian. He became Christian. Um, David Ginsburg, Jew, Christian David B. Ginsburg, he became a Christian. It's kind of odd that they had that kind of thing in their background, you know. Um, and most of us have kind of gone the other way here, right? Uh, so that's pretty interesting. And Ginsburg is problematic to say the least. Next slide. So, well, we went to the PEF. And um, this was uh, mm -hmm. Ross's doing. And Ross, did you have any help setting that up? Was it a few people helped you, right? Uh, yeah, we, and then we, we just wrote a lot of letters. Right. And these people are, they were so good. And so I wanted to say also that uh, we became members, you know, because there's so much there. Next. So you see Ross, you get to hold the documents. You get the, I can't, don't have the kids look at that. That's Moabitica. Um, it was the early versions of um, bad pictures. And uh, so when you, when you look at these things, you see, you see that what, what they saw. I mean, there's nothing different. And, and I'll tell you, the Germans and the Brits, the libraries they keep are stunning. I mean, you know, we have the Library of Congress, but they have a much older library, you know. Mm -hmm. All right, next slide. So we then went to where the, the, the scrolls, Ross was still looking for them, but I told him they're probably gone by now. Um, we went to the British Museum, and that's where um, they were uh, displayed. So uh, at that time, Ginsburg um, is starting to think they're real, but again, a hundred or a million pounds, a million pounds is at stake. That's what, that's what Shapiro wants for these, which is a lot of cash. Now, let me tell you at the time when it went to the British Museum, the whole world back then with newspapers and stuff. We're talking about original biblical manuscript found. I mean, the world was on fire. And then eventually a lot of political things happened. Ross details this in his book. A lot of political things happen and they're determined to be uh, fraudulent. Next slide. I went to the Netherlands um, to Amsterdam. It's an interesting city if you've never been. Mm -hmm. And uh, turned out a, a young boy that I guided in his life when he didn't have a father, um, he, he moved there and lives there. So I have a, a young kid that helps me out um, there when we go there. And um, it's been great. 
Well, the manuscripts supposedly maintained uh, remained at the British Museum, and, Sh and Shapiro went to the Netherlands. Uh, in the Netherlands, there was this big um, conference on um, ancient manuscripts, uh, Semitic manuscripts, and so forth. And um, he also, during this time, continued to sell manuscripts to the British Museum. So in other words, they bought other manuscripts for, from him. Um, and then he was found dead in his hotel room in Rotterdam on the 9th of March, eight, 19, uh, 1884. I must say, he, they said he committed suicide. There's a lot of new information that says it's pretty hard to put two bullets in your head when you're committing suicide. Just saying. We, we are looking at all options. You know, and again, um, the other thing that is a part of my f process, and I think Ross and Jono, look, we're going to go on. Tell me something that proves that this is a forgery. And until you, until you do that, we're going to keep looking. And so far, I haven't found anything. And, and if it happens, I, 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 I want to know the truth. Next slide. So um, after Shapira dies, um, what happens is, uh, as you can see here, um, 15 of the leather strips were still at the British Museum. Ah! Didn't I tell you there were 16 strips? Ah! That's the thing that we're going to talk about later. Uh, we have a letter from Bond to Ginsburg saying that Shapir's widow has requested her. They're worthless. Give them back to me. Mm -hmm. We have no record of what happened next. This is bothersome. Um, and it's where the trail starts to get fuzzy. Next slide. So we found out that, well, through people like Matthew Hamilton and other great researchers, that Quaritch, a, a bookseller in London, had them for sale. And so uh, we all went to um, the Quartz uh, bookstore. And um, we were treated with such gratitude. It was so honorable. Uh, it was such a great uh, trip over there. It was phenomenal. So we see that they were listed. And they have the listings of, you know, they don't have the strips, but they have the listings of what they, so it said, so they were, remember, a million pounds, and they were being sold for 20 pounds. They called forgery scripts. Forgery strips. And so um, the, he, he paid at, at the, uh, the big uh, 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 sale, he paid uh, 10 pounds, 5 shillings, and he sold them for 20 pounds. So he doubled his money, essentially. Next slide. So we went there, and, and um, this young gentleman helped us. It was just so amazing. Anything you ask, they go and get it. It's, they, we were treated like royalty. And there you can see us looking at all these manuscripts and um, and this kid has a sense of humor. So he tweeted out um, uh, on April Fool's Day, which we didn't catch, we found parts of the manuscript in a book. Oh, and we're like, goodness. and he's like, that's an English sense of humor, you know? Like, yeah. what? Ah, no, it's <laughs> April Fool's. <laughs> they had fun. Brilliant kid. You know, he's a young kid and, and just so well-mannered. And, and everyone there was great. Next slide. So... We have the records, and so they talk about the different, um, you know, things that they sell, and this is, this is where you can see that they are, and, and um, they have, every year they publish these volumes, and they keep records, which is really important for us to find out what happened. Next slide. And then they're gone. Who'd you sell them to? Well, he didn't write his name down. We have no record of who bought them. The trail goes cold. So in the years that follow, many people had these, um, these theories as, as, as they do, you know. How many theories are there on why and how did John Kennedy die? Or did he die? Um, the most accepted theory is they were bought by Sir Charles Nicholson and Alan Crown proposed in 1970. They were likely destroyed at the Nicholson home fire in uh, 1899. So that was kind of the accepted thought of where the scrolls, they're gone, they've been burnt, um, bamus. Next. Ah, then there are people like Matthew Hamilton. And I'll tell you, what a great, great man this is. This Matthew Hamilton um, truly understands. Uh, he has, a, he has a, a laser focus, never leaves his home, all on the internet. And he's got books. So if you, if you watch Yoram Sabo's movie, uh, Shapira and I, he goes to see Matthew Hamilton. And this guy is, he's an incredible guy. He has a, a house room, like a, like a garage dedicated with rows and rows of books about Shapira and other things, but mostly Shapira. 
and he has a cute little pig that walks around with him. Really incredible um, Aussie man. He's a pet pig. So using a complex Google search, he discovered that there was a man named Phillips Brooks Mason who became the eventual possessor of the Shapira manuscript. Uh, there, and, and a culinary, uh, Patricia Francis was doing her master's thesis on Phillips Brooks Mason, who was a great collector. He was a doctor, but he did a lot of collecting. And he was um, a conchologist. Uh, now, he, he was a medical doctor, but he loved the study of conchs. So um, in the, in the, in the uh, obituary, it said uh, it was, he was the one who presented a paper on the forgery of Shapira on the 8th of March in 1889. And we have a record of that meeting in the Burton Chronicle of uh, March of 1989. Um, the point being, um, this, was, um, he, he, this was done, it was shown at a Masonic um, uh, uh, temple, are they called? Lodge. Lodge, Masonic Lodge, excuse me. And so um, that's the last time it's seen in public. Next slide. So we went up to Burton-on-Trent, um, where, um, for me, the, the most interesting thing was that Bass Ale was made there. And the Bass family are all buried there. So I did a little sightseeing. Oh, there's Mr. Bass. There's Mrs. Bass. And, uh, and it's a, a really great beer-making place, Burton-on-Trent. <sighs> Anyways, David Atkins was another person that Patty met, um, and she said, I think they were buried with Mason. And so we went to Mason's grave, um, and, and we, we took all the pictures and started looking into it deeper and deeper and deeper. It was phenomenal. Next slide. So we went, and this is where the this, this script, they're probably in here. This was Mason's home. This is at the bottom of um, a place um, called, oddly enough, Sinai House. And there's thoughts that they could be buried there. We, we don't know. Um, so a lot of theories start to come out, and this is where the trail gets very difficult. It's like in a cold case, because we're in a cold case, obviously. And when you start looking at what, what could have happened, first thing that, that a good detective will do is review everyone's um, notes. Just to refresh the memory. Oh, yeah, Tommy did say that, you know, that kind of thing. So we, we, were, at, we were everywhere. In Sinai Houses, we stayed there. And it's, a, it's on the creepy side of life. Anyways, next slide. So uh, I'm going to block this picture. Uh, so there's David Atkins. He's amazing. Well, wait. And then here, here's the, um, I, I have three of them. And then here's the, um, here's, here's Sinai House on the grounds. This creepy statue kept staring at me. I, I don't know. It was just weird. And then, of course, after we left, what happens? We're put in the local tabloids. Buried in Burton, the lost 11th commandment. There's Ross, me, and my wife. I go, this, what, are you kidding me? I love it. It's just like, holy cow. We're in the paper. and You're famous in England. You get you somebody famous. Everybody going to the grocery store is like, look at this. Yeah. It's, it's, it's buried in Burton. Burton on, Burton on Trent, and we're like, oh, no. Uh, of course, um, it, it was thrilling, and David was an incredible person. Take, a, take another picture or another slide. So what are the, con what are the conclusions? What are the conclusions? Um, there's a sign. to the queen in here. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Here are my conclusions. There's a significant amount of evidence that was, wasn't weighed in when the, the term of a forgery was made. Um, many of the scholars from his day did believe it's probably a real document, um, but the politics of the day forced another result. This happens. And we have new evidence as to where the scrolls are, and we'll follow up on them. And we, we really need to get modern testing to be done so that we can understand. And if they said that these, these, these manuscripts are from the 1850s, then they were right, all, all the naysayers. But if they say they're from like five to 100, 500 to 1000 BCE, then that's another story. Um, and so here, you can stop right there. No, no, just don't touch anything. Um, no, she, she, she clicked it before. So there's a lot of people to say thank you to. Um, of course, Ross Nichols, who's dedicated so much of his life 
uh, Patty uh, was uh, also a, a relentless researcher. She looks for the crazy stuff, and you know, one out of a hundred things is like, oh my God, look at this. Jono has been a great help, and is going to continue to be a great help. Petra, amazing lady, um, and we're going to help her in the uh, in, in some Jewish uh, studies here in the United States. David Atkins, amazing, amazing person um, that that is looking at it. He tends to like start. We have to sign an NDA with him because he just will start telling everybody about it. He got William Shatner interested and they were going to do a live thing. Wow. You know, we got to be careful of those things. <laughs> uh, Matthew Hamilton, of course, is a savant on this subject. Um, uh, just an amazing man. Of course, Dr. Dershowitz, he wrote the book on the, you know, the textual side. And, you know, he is at Harvard and he's a brilliant Scholar, he's also helped us get access to uh, the libraries in Berlin and so forth. Dr. Tabor has written uh, papers, but all he he kind of got us on there with Dr. Gibson. There, they were coming back from a conference, and they just said, "You know, that Shapiro scroll. We should look into that again." And then they kind of the ball fumbled, and Ross picked it up and goes, "Dave, what do you think of this?" And it, and it, I'm like. Like everyone else, oh, it's, it's a forgery. And then you start looking and go, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, Yoram Sabo, amazing, amazing movie, um, Shapira and I, and it's free um, on uh, different platforms. And, of course, Dr. Charlesworth um, is spoke to Ross, and he's another. And there's a lot of people on our side um, that are tr trying to say, some even say, oh, it wasn't, it, it's, a, it's a real document. It's, it's authentic. I'm, I'm saying... I think it might be authentic, but I, I don't know, and it's not been proven to be a forgery to me. Because what does forgery mean? That's a big word. So we have a lot more um, airline miles to put on, and uh, it's exciting to go to these places and, and look and, and see what's out there and talk to people. And, um, you know, the idea is even if we found the, one part of the strip of the script, we can do a lot with that. There's a lot of good analytical techniques now, um, you know, in the, in the analysis of ink. If you've ever looked at the analysis of ink on the uh, Declaration of Independence, when you go to the Library of Congress, it's pretty interesting. They know who, what pan, blah, all that stuff. It's very, very good. So I'm just saying um, the tr trial isn't over. It's a cold case, um, and I, I, uh, I would like to... Uh, uh, de help defend um, Moses Shapiro because um, I, I, I'm very convinced that um, if he did forge it, he's one of the greatest biblical scholars that I've ever have kind of heard of. And I think uh, Ross and uh, Jono will um, take on after that. You know, they're going to talk about it, and it's phenomenal. So um, I want to thank everybody, and, uh, you know, um, I'll be able to talk about this in more detail with Ross and Jono, and Patty has a lot of insight into this. Um, and, of course, um, we're, we'll, we'll keep you posted. Maybe on the 80th we'll have a surprise for you. We'll have a surprise. Uh, I have we'll, we'll, <laughs> if, it's, if it's at all possible, um, I have some really good friends on my side that are helping me, and um, you never know when you're going to need to pull on those friendships. So I've had dreams about it, too. I won't go into that, uh, but I'll talk offline about that, which I don't dream about things like that at all, but um, I've had some crazy dreams. All I do remember in one dream is that we're, we're speeding down a street in London and there's people shooting at us. So maybe there's a movie in there. I don't, the I, I don't want to, I, I, I won't tell you because they, to, they told me where it was, I think. I wish I could remember. I'm going into hypnosis now. No, I'm only kidding. Uh, I, and all kidding aside, um, you got to keep an open mind. If it's a forgery, I want to know that it's a forgery. I think it's a significant issue that, that, that we have to deal with in, in biblical scholarship and biblical archaeology and history. And if, if, if this, and, and I'm really excited about Jono's talk because he really compares it from a, you know, he's, he's got a degree in, in, um, in, in, in theology, and he looks at text all the time. So he's taking it from that point of view. Um, but when I'm reading it, I'm like, wow, this this sounds authentic to me. And there's a difference between that and being able to do that. Anyways, um, Patty is telling me I got to quit, but I, I did. I'm right on time. Actually, I'm a little early. So uh, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, and in closing, I want to thank everyone for the support for the United Israel World Union. Um, it is, like uh, David Horowitz said, there can be um, no world union without a united Israel. And um, I, I believe that. And uh, the Torah faith for everyone 
And that's what this script is about, is this, these strips are about the Torah faith uh, as it was revealed to the person who got the revelation mm -hmm. and who met the Almighty face to face. Um, uh, there hasn't been someone like Moses ever since. So, um, you know, that, that other Moses, the one that gave us some rules to follow, um, I hope he's also vindicated in this whole thing. Um, anyways, uh, we're going to go out to lunch, um, and um, we can go offline right now. Um, and, and then uh, if I could have you people stay here just for three minutes, I want to show you a, a, a video. Yeah, I want to show you a video, but thank you. Shalom.